at some point in their lives, every academic has had a student say to them, but what other feedback have you got for me? Which leads me to ask the question, how can you make sure that your feedback is effective so that a student feels that they've got everything that they need? This is about the time you take to actually talk to students about the feedback. So often in higher education, and this is not to blame academics at all, it's to do with workload. People give feedback, but don't actually necessarily have the time to talk students through it. And we know again, the research evidence shows us this over the past two decades, that if you write feedback and then you sit with the student, or whoever it is that you have been assessing, and you talk through the feedback and make them understand it, that is where that change, that vital change happens. And you can be clear. And also, there are points, of course there are, for all of us, no matter how expert you are, sometimes you don't quite get it right. Or you may be working with a student, say for the first time, who has English as an additional language, or has some kind of learning difficulty, that you as an educator need to just spend time getting to know them and understand how do I better communicate with the student? So it's not a fact of blaming anyone, it's a fact of learning how we do it well and as good as we can. What does good feedback look like? Well, we have lots of evidence now for feedback and what good quality feedback looks like. So one of the most important things is that it needs to be understandable. Just because you write loads of stuff or tell someone loads of stuff doesn't mean it's useful. So it needs to be something that a student can understand, can act upon. I, there has to be some kind of movement. They've got to be able to do something with it so that they can move themselves on. And also it's about timing. We know that timing is critical. That's what the research shows us. If students don't get feedback in good time, um, then it becomes useless in effect to them. So it's really important to try and enact processes of feedback as soon as you can with students. The interesting thing is lots of teachers do this anyway. We do iterations of constant feedback in the classroom anyway. You know, even when someone's answered a question and you're pointing and you go, that's a great answer because you pointed, that's feedback. People forget that we're doing it all the time. But that formal notion of writing feedback down for students on pieces, say, of draft work, which is where it matters, my argument is, and this is my own personal opinion, rather than, um, other, I know other assessment experts would disagree with me on this, but I think it's actually quite a waste of markers time writing feedback on final summative pieces of work. Feedback needs to happen earlier on in the cycle. It's too late when a student's handed a bit of work in and had it graded. They need to know about feedback earlier on. So we need to think differently about the cycle of drafting, assessing and feeding back to students before we get to that summative end, particularly in higher ed. In higher ed, the use of marking rubrics has increased. Mm -hmm. A good, complete rubric will have quite a lot of information on it on each criterion for each performance level. Mm -hmm. Is that a good first step to adding to the feedback or adding to the richness of feedback that students get? Or do you still need to write more feedback on top of that? than where you've got really clear performance levels per criterion? You still do, because another key ingredient of feedback are examples. So being able to point to them and say, you could improve that section, moving it from say B2 up to A1, if you, and then giving them an example. That's the key with the feedback, is actually showing them what's going on. Here's what you could do differently. Here's how you could approach it differently. And it's not, sh it's not telling them you know, giving them instructions, it's about saying, here's what you could do, and here's how can you can build this and change this. And then it's up to you how you take that apart from there. So giving them some autonomy as well in that, that process afterwards. But you're right, the idea of a good rubric is so important. And the other thing is, and this is a very common issue in higher education, is spending time talking to students about it. The number of times, um, I have been asked to go and talk to people about their assessments and then have got lots and lots of academics of all different disciplines in a room and said, so in what session do you go through all the marking criteria and the assessment rubrics with the students? And the number of people who put their hands up and say, I don't do it. My next question is always, how do you expect them to know what to do if you don't talk them through it? 
the, you know, it's, an, it's not some kind of miraculous intervention that's going to happen. You have to learn how to do this stuff and it takes time. And as I've said before, again, that's about seeing assessment as a part of teaching and learning rather than seeing it as something that happens later on. Marking is an important aspect of the assessment process, but is also one that's time consuming. How can academics make their marking more efficient while ensuring that it remains of the same quality that it should be? With marking, it really depends on the subject and the content. So it's thinking about what do I want to give to the students at this point? If you're doing the straightforward task of marking a summative piece of assessment at the end of a course, you are just marking and the, the quality of your marking is totally dependent on how you construct the rubric for marking. If you do that well, if it aligns with the curriculum, if it aligns with the kind of outcomes and criteria you're looking for, it should be a relatively straightforward activity because you're looking for the evidence and you're giving a mark where, it's, where it is. However, I think what often happens here is people confuse marking with marking and feedback. And that's where it gets confusing and much more time consuming. So that's why it's really important to be clear about the task that you're doing. If you are just marking, you need to think carefully then, what do I want them to show me? And how do I structure that into the criteria so that when I'm marking, I know exactly what I'm looking for. If it's not there, it's not there. If it is, it is. And that's it. There has been an increase of late in institutions using peer assessment. Are students ready to assess their peers? And what do they need to maybe overcome the anxiety of assessing someone that they would sit in a room with before and after this task? so that they can actually give them useful feedback as part of that assessment? I think the first thing that's really important to do is to remind students when they're doing this that they're not responsible for somebody's overall outcome. They're a final grade for a piece. When they're giving feedback, they're giving feedback. And it's about the idea of what constructive feedback looks like. We do it a lot at UCL. It's a really important part of teaching and learning for all our students, undergraduate and postgraduate level. And we get them to do that with one another because we know the evidence from the research shows us that it actually enhances students' engagement with a topic if they know they're going to be peer assessing and giving each other that kind of information because students can learn a lot from one another. And it's a case of thinking about in a classroom how you pair up students or put them in groups to actually share work and talk about it. And the other thing is it's about assessment literacy, helping them understand what it is they're looking for. It's quite interesting that actually at primary phase, children are really, really good at peer feedback, about being honest, about being open with one another, not necessarily being rude, but just being clear. And it's interesting as we get older and we become more reserved and anxious about how we might feel or how another person might feel, then we begin to find it more difficult to give very open feedback. So it requires practice and it requires engagement with it. Um, and you have to be fairly persistent, I think, with students, getting them to practice it and do it. Mm -hmm.